CR101radio.com, podcasts, and more. Construction 101. I am your host, Jeremy Walker, and we have a topic for today to discuss. We are going to be talking about the question, should Christians believe in conspiracy theories? Very important. Lots of people love conspiracy theories, love to talk about them, and love to study them on a non-stop, endless basis. So this can be our topic for today. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can go to our website at cr101radio.com forward slash Christian Reconstruction 101. So welcome back, guys. There's a couple things I'd like to know and discuss about conspiracy theories. It's not that they're excitable. It's not that people don't like to have fun discussing them, but sometimes they take them a little too seriously. And that's what we're going to talk about on this episode, about what should the Christian's perspective be on conspiracy theories themselves. Because I don't know if you know about it, but Christians, I'll give you the answer, should subscribe to conspiracy theories. Well, not conspiracy theories, plural, but a conspiracy theory, more of a conspiracy fact Point of fact. So there's a couple things that I want to start with. Words and ideas that shape the discussion when we are talking about conspiracy theories. Well, some of these words you might be familiar with, some you may not. Here they are. Determinism. Predestination. Foreknowledge. Predictive prophecy. Sovereignty. Faith. Providence. And, of course, power. So to start us, I want to start with where I think the Christian's perspective should begin. There are three types of conspiracy theories that are out there that we're going to discuss, some briefly and some more in point of fact and maybe a little bit in more detail. But there is satanic determinism, Satan and satanic determinism. There is man and humanistic determinism. And then, of course, there is God and the divine determination. So let's go ahead and start with the passage, Psalms chapter 2. Quote, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord said unto me, Thou art my son, This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Unquote. Psalms chapter 2. Well, as Christians, we should not have a pessimistic view of the world. I know that most people talk about it, conspiracy theories, They listen to Alec Jones and all kinds of other things on the Internet, especially during the whole COVID craze. We have people talking about worldwide depopulation. 
We have people who are flat earthers, round earthers, moon deniers, uh, people who deny the moon landing. The conspiracy theories continue to go on ad nauseum. And I have to admit, quite a few of them are fun to listen to. As long as you see it, I think, as a form of entertainment. All too many people, in my opinion, take conspiracy theories very seriously, and I think it makes them forget their faith. As Christians, we are supposed to have faith in God and the Word of God. And the Word of God is not pessimistic. It never has been pessimistic, not even a little bit. See, one of the first questions you're going to have to ask yourself as Christians, and if you care about what the Bible actually says, I mean, if you just like conspiracy theories and you don't care what the Bible says, then this is really not for you. You're just one of those people that want to wear a tinfoil hat on your head. Maybe you want to just run around and despise the government and hate people and run around and they're poison on our water. And maybe that's you. Maybe that's who you are about conspiracy theories and going too far with them. But you have to say conspiracy theories are correct. Man does plot. Man does plan. Man does attempt. So... Those are all true. It doesn't mean that conspiracy theories all have truth to them, and it doesn't mean that they're all crackpots. We have to ask ourselves one fundamental question. Where does real, ultimate power reside? Is it with God? Satan? Maybe man? Maybe man collectively? See, that's where your question really has to start with. It's a theological question. And most conspiracy theorists are those that are avid listeners to it and followers of it, don't ask themselves that question. Where does real ultimate power come from? So I want to start with a couple things. We'll start with where it doesn't come from. Because the Christian message is not one of negativity. It is not one of foreboding. It is not one that looks at the future and shrivels like a wet mouse in a windstorm. That is not Christianity. Christianity is bold. Christianity is confident. Christianity stands firm. It knows where it's going. It has confidence in where it's going, and it knows it's going to win. Now, Christianity does not mean people who call themselves Christians per se, but it is our faith, all those that hold to the Christian faith, because God has told us what the future holds. So let's start There's a lot of people out there. These people are in Christian circles. They like to talk about the deep things of Satan and demonic powers. This is what would be in the category of satanic determination. This is where satanic powers and spiritual creatures, they are plotting, they are planning, and they have an end where they are pushing towards mankind their battle with God in the heavens, whatever you want to call it. I remember Frank Peretti's book. I can't remember the title. It escapes me right now. But it was all about demons and demonic powers in this small little town. And I remember it was a very famous book at the time. And I remember listening to an audio book of it, and they had these big, powerful voices for the demons. But the whole city was in the grips and the power of satanic forces. And these satanic forces were something you had to be aware of because they're coming to get you. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. This is complete fiction, utter fiction and stupidity. See, first point I have about this concept is that, let's start with Satan. He's a creature. He's not creative in the least. He is absolutely 100% a creature, a spiritual being to be sure but still a creature, like any other creature of God's creation. See, Satan himself is the one who kind of started out with man in the garden, and he suggested that man attempt to declare independence from God. This was a satanic influence, satanic temptations. Man did not have to listen to it. Man could have overcome. Adam and his wife Eve both could have come through there with flying colors. But they liked the idea. They liked the idea of being independent, kind of like Satan, joining the crew, being pirates, you could say, against God. That didn't go so well. But Satan, he does have, according to the Bible, power. 
There's no debate about that. He really does have terrible power. And he also has authority. No debate about that. Very clear, he is a person with power and authority. But here's the kicker, and this is where the Christian message should be shouted to the tops for all their crying over demonic forces and Frank Peretti books all over the place, is that at all times, that power and that authority is limited by God's permission. See, all you have to know is look at the book of Job. Job's a great place to go. If you haven't read it, you should. Where Satan and God have a conversation, and God suggests Satan to Satan, Job, tempt Job, try Job, why not check out Job? But Satan says, well, I can't touch him. You've put your powers on him. And then at three different levels, God allows Satan to touch him, to mess with his life. First, of course, it was his children. Then, of course, it was his wealth and his health. But he couldn't kill him. At all points in time, Satan could only do those things God permitted him to do. Does this sound like Christians should be afraid of this person as if he's some out-of-control, powerful being that's coming to get you? No, it's not. And that's not how we should teach about Satan, his power, and authority to our children. Now, we'll get to some other points later because his power is a fearful thing, but only when God lets him off the leash to get you. Satan's not the one you have to be concerned about. It's God's anger, his protection that he might withhold from you that you should be worried about, but not about Satan himself. He's firmly on the leash. See, Satan has, and his fellow angels, they have a very particular destination, eternal damnation. If you want another look at that, go into the Gospels, where Jesus runs into legion. These were countless demons who were infesting a man's body outside of town, and when they came across him, they begged that he would let them go. See, the problem was this. They knew that they were going to be tortured. They knew their time was coming to an end. But they even recognized who Jesus was. But there's nothing they could do about it. They shriveled in fear at knowing what was coming their way. Now, is this how Christians talk about demonic powers? about the Lord that they claim to worship and serve? Is this how they talk about how Satan has to beg for permission to do something? On a leash, like a dog. And how the angels themselves, these demon angels, the fallen ones, are absolutely terrified, terrified of Christ. The man that Christians are supposed to call Lord They are followers of Jesus Christ, and yet they're going to shriek and run away at the idea of terrible demons coming to get them in their little towns. This is the most dumb, stupid, idiotic idea that Christianity has ever posited. It's absolute heresy. It's untrue. And hundreds and thousands of people, for a very long time now, have been taught bad, terrible doctrine. So we have to reconstruct the idea of the theology behind satanic and demonic and satanic determination. They don't determine anything. The only thing is that Satan and his minions have been determined. They have an end, and they lose. And there's nothing they can do here and now to alter anything that God wants done. So we can kind of toss aside the idea of conspiracy theories related to demonic, satanic, or otherwise creatures. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Number two, let's move on away from Satan and his minions now to man. And for quite a few people, I would say they talk about man and his institutions as if they were more powerful than Satan, more authority than Satan, both of which are dumb, stupid, and ridiculous because Satan is much more powerful than any one man. And... He has much more authority than any one man. But hey, let's move on to man and humanistic determination. These are the ones crying about moon landings, fluorides in waters, 
uh, mosquitoes that are changed to come and get you. These are the clouds in the sky. These are the UN vaccinations, depopulation, you name it. It's all there. This is what we're talking about now. Man and his efforts to determine something. He's going to plot. He's going to plan. He's going to have a cabal. And then they're going to bring it all to pass because they have the power, the predestination, the foreknowledge of predictive prophecy and the sovereignty to do it all on their own because they are going to create providence through man's power. Well, let's start and talk about man a little bit from a biblical standpoint, and let's see how much power man has, shall we? First, let's start at the beginning. Always a great place to be. Adam and Eve, they attempted to declare independence from God, be their own determiners of good and evil. How did that work out? Well, it didn't. They were then cursed, cast out of the garden, doomed to die, and all their progeny fell with them. In Adam, all men fell. So, he doomed mankind from the beginning, Adam did. Determination on that point did not work out. He could not rebel against God. Satan's lies were just that, and he lost just like God said. Let's move on to the Tower of Babel, shall we? Because, of course, this was the first recorded attempt at mankind unifying, not spreading it all over the world, the first United Nations, you could call it. They built the Tower of Babel. They were attempting to unify themselves against God and build a place with their name on it, not the name of God, not to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, but for mankind to glorify man and enjoy man forever. But how did that go for them? Well, God came down, he confused their languages, and spread them out all over the world to reduce their ability to do sinful acts together. And guess what? That still affects us today. Hmm. Doesn't sound like mankind did very well in his attempts at humanistic determination, does it? All the conspiracy theories in the world didn't amount to a hill of beans, you could say. Then we can move on to another man that I think was a great place to point out, King Balak. Moses and the Israelites are coming through the desert. They try to come through Edom on their great exodus. He does not allow them to. He calls on a man who is known for his ability to curse people. The Bible does not, in any shape, form, or fashion, deny his abilities. This is Balaam. Balaam. And, of course, you might know the story. You might not. You can look it up. King Balak hires Balaam, or at least tries to hire Balaam first, to come and curse Israel. Balaam, of course, is warned not to do this. Not to do this. So he sends them away, but then they come back with more and more money. Eventually, Balaam says, okay, and is given permission by God personally to go with King Balak to curse them. Well, then what happens? On the way, three times, an angel comes and nearly kills Balaam. Why? He was only leaving with permission. So why would God try to kill Balaam after giving him permission to leave? Well, the answer is simple. The angel gave the answer to Balaam. You can only say what I tell you to. And if you don't, you're dead. Now, Balaam is not a Christian. Balaam is not serving God out of some idea of loyalty. He does have the power to curse man. But like Satan... His abilities are limited. It does not deny he could do it. He had some form of satanic power and ability to curse people, but only people God wanted cursed. King Balak takes Balaam up to the mountains to see Israel way down below. And of course, Moses nor the Israelites are aware of this part of the story. Well, they sacrifice upon the mountains, trying to get favor with God, trying to curse Israel, but the words that Balaam were given, not curses, but blessings instead. They moved from mountain to mountain, trying again and again. King Balak wanted Balaam to find the right spot in the world. We've got to find the right magical place, the right, the right gemstones, and the right mountain, and the right height, and the right depth, and the right words to say that we can get the great powers that be, i.e. God, to do what we want. It was an attempt. This is what magic is, by the way, if you didn't know it. Man's attempts to get God to listen to him. 
That's what magic is from top to bottom. And it doesn't mean waving a wand, but I won't go into the subject now. But anyways, this did not work. And instead of cursing, Israel was giving blessing upon blessing upon blessing. So man's attempts at conspiracy theories when you didn't even know it didn't work out. Looks like God was paying attention. Nebuchadnezzar was another great uh, example as well. King Nebuchadnezzar. He attempted to give himself all the glory for everything that he had. Absolutely everything. And if you remember the the story of King Nebuchadnezzar, golden uh, statues, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, eventually gets turned into an animal. Basically his mind, not his body. And of course, after seven years, he's then given his reason and ability back and he glorifies God. They says of him he can do whatever he wants in heaven and on earth, and no man can stay his hand. Well, most powerful man on the planet, given glory to God as is. Well, it doesn't look like conspiracy theories work. It sounds like the message of the Bible is man declaring again and again, he's not God, but there is one. One of my favorite stories we were still talking about humanistic determination, was the Grand Prince Haman. Now, he, of course, if you remember him, was with the story of Esther and Mordecai. He hated Mordecai, wanted to kill him. He had a great kind of a past, won't get into that. But he wanted to kill Mordecai and all the Hebrews, Israelites, like him. And sure enough, he almost got it. Great plan, got favor with the king, got permission to do it. And he was going to get permission to hang Haman right there in front of his home, dangle him 50 feet to show everybody how powerful he was. And that same night, wouldn't you know it, king couldn't sleep. And then Haman was asked the question, what would you do if the king wants to delight in somebody? What should he do to him? And he gives the answer. And then he says, yes, thank you very much. Now go get Mordecai and do that to him. And of course, he had to abase himself to the man he hated. And then at the party which was Queen Esther, she reveals who she is and what Haman has done. Haman has no idea that Esther was one of the Israelites, the Hebrews, and he had no idea that she was going to be included in his plots and plans. King is angry and has him hung on his own noose outside his home. And then, of course, the king gives the Israelites the ability to protect themselves, and they do, repeatedly destroying all their enemies. And it looked like it happened all at the very last second. Quite amazing, isn't it? Does this sound like the testimony of man making determinations, prophecies about himself and how he's going to succeed and having the power to do it? No, it sounds more like God plays around with mankind. Yeah, kind of like a man watching an ant running around a magnifying glass before he burns his legs off. This is the Christian message. Not being scared like a field mice. There are many other things that I could bring up about how people tried to thwart their future. We had King Ahab, King Saul. They were told they were going to die. Both of those men, when they entered battle, put on clothing of a normal person. And both times, wouldn't you know it, coincidentally, they were shot by chance. The soldiers had placed an arrow on the bow, flung it into the sky, and wouldn't you know it, Both men were struck and killed. See, man can't avoid anything. There is a future and you can't avoid it. To give another interesting one, but it's not as deadly, was whenever Peter was told, you are going to deny me three times before the cock crows. Oh, I would never do that. I would never do that. I would never do that. And sure enough, in the morning, before it rose, Before the rooster, he denied Christ three times. He knew the future. Couldn't avoid it. Who sounds like they are determining their future? Peter or God? Peter said, I would never do that. I'll die first. Yet he did it. His future was set. His future was determined. He was told what was going to happen. And he didn't and could not avoid it. Man has no ability to determine his future personally or collectively as a society. We saw that with Haman. 
We won't go too much more into that because I think I've made my point. But here's the last nail in the coffin. The Israelites in Jesus' day, they thought they could free themselves from the words and declarations of Christ just by killing him. That's right. They mocked him at the bottom of his cross. If you're the king, if you're the Messiah, come down and we'll worship you. They thought they won as he was dying on the cross. But when men think that they have won, that's when they've lost the most. You cannot beat God. And by sending Christ to his death, they were ensuring his victory. God is not like man. His determinations and plans are far beyond what man could ever conceive. Just like Haman. You can't see the forest for the trees. Man is has no ability to determine anything for himself, even if he knew what was going to happen. He couldn't avoid it. Because it's God that makes these determinations. Let's go through, because I think I've pretty much made these points, but I want to run through some things about God and divine determination. Now, we've pretty much been talking about that already, because everything we've been talking about is how God has thwarted, or is the most powerful, or it's his divine determination that is the main factor. But the entire story of the Bible follows according to what God has declared, the entire Bible. He started and declares of himself that he set the end from the beginning. Now, this is before anything was created and everything was already planned out. Everything was planned out down to the last decision. Everything. All the works of God were known unto him from the beginning. This is the declaration of who our God is. He is working everything, and always has been, in perfect, determinative harmony, so that everything brings about the redemption of the world, his people, and the judgment of those rebels. He has given prophecy to man. He makes sure that they come about, and they do come about because he said it. Daniel prophesied about God's plan over the victory of the earth. Nebuchadnezzar gave testimony over God's power and sovereignty of all things. Job declared the unknowable knowledge of God and the absolute ridiculous notion that man could know anything better than God or teach him anything at all. See, God's people, that's us if you're a Christian, are called to declare the duty of all of mankind to repent and to submit to God and to his Christ. Because God has already prophesied his complete and total victory over sin and evil. See, the heavens may declare the glory of God when we look at them, but it's the word of God that declares his sovereignty, predestination, and unavoidable determination. These things are where our faith is based. See, Psalms 2 is absolutely great. It talks about how men plot and plan. And it's true that men do plot and plan. But God laughs as he watches man attempt to take power for himself or attempt to determine his own future or even definitely the idea and the concept of the future of reality. He also calls us as Christians, his people, to join him in laughing at them. Laugh at them. Yes, they are really plotting and planning. Conspiracy theories are absolutely real. They are trying. They are trying to cast off the bands that God has put on them, to cast away his people, and they've been trying that since the beginning of time. Since Christ came for 2,000 years, they've been trying to stop God, to stop his Christ, and to stop his people. And for 2,000 years, they have lost. And it is over, Christ said. It is finished. All power, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to him. So our job is to go teach and preach. See, Christians do not have the job to study the futile, satanic, and humanistic determinations of others. They are to occupy themselves with building the kingdom of God and declaring its surety, and its 
victory. See, the greatest conspiracy theory of them all is that God makes all things come to pass for the good of his people and the victory of his kingdom. When evil men think that they are winning, that is the time that they will suffer their greatest defeat. This is the Christian conspiracy theory, and it's more than just a theory. It's a fact. Resistance against the kingdom of God is futile. This is our message. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Thank you again. This is Jeremy Walker for Christian Reconstruction 101. Hopefully giving you something to think about and the Christian perspective on different subjects. This one, how we should view conspiracy theories and have confidence in the conspiracy theory. The one where God is making all things work for his good and for the good of his people. So, live your life. Keep God's commandments. Love your wife. Have lots of children. Go to business and make money and it'll live at peace with all men because God is on the throne. Thank you for joining me and God bless.